Typhoons. Swirling in the Pacific, they are the world's largest storms. And when typhoons hit a Korean harbor, sailors struggle to survive. Blizzards. Skiers pray for them, but when they stray outside safe boundaries, the white stuff can be deadly. Once in a century floods, when rainfall hits this hard, dams can't hold. In northern Quebec, city streets become thundering waterfalls. Powerful storms and the people who survive them. Coming up on Storm Warning. Typhoon. In Korea, legend calls it the evil wind spirit. Busan Harbor, Korea's largest port, is perpetually hit head-on by the torrential rains and ferocious winds of these giant tropical cyclones. In the Western Hemisphere, they're called hurricanes, but in the Pacific, they're typhoons. In 1993, a monumental battle unfolds. A battered freighter with four men on board has broken loose from its moorings. Lashed by relentless winds, it slams against the shore and starts to sink. The four crewmen agonize about what to do. When a giant wave rips two of them out of the boat, One manages to cling to the side of the ship. The other relies on his safety vest for survival. The remaining two crewmen face a life or death decision. If they stay, they could be sucked down with the ship. If they jump, they could drown. Suddenly, the first man leaps. Rescuers rush to throw him ropes. They pull him from the crushing waves. Within moments, rescuers pull two more of the frightened men from the churning water. The fourth sailor is never found. Busan Harbor isn't always dark and turbulent. Situated on the southeast corner of the Korean Peninsula, this city of four million is famous for its sparkling sand beaches and bustling commercial port. A natural harbor, it's located at the heart of the Pacific Rim trade routes. For 2,000 years, ships have been docking here. And for just as long, typhoons have been sinking them. Pusan lies directly in the path of tropical storms that begin every summer in the monsoon trough, an area of the western Pacific near Guam where easterly and westerly winds collide. As they head northwest toward Korea, they are deflected by erratic weather fronts that make their path notoriously unpredictable. In 1995, Korean meteorologists once again track an approaching typhoon outside Busan Harbor. Doppler radar indicates that it will lose strength and bypass Korea. But this typhoon, named Fei, does the unexpected. Fierce winds from the upper atmosphere swoop down and steer it directly towards Busan. When we return, Residents rush for cover in winds so fierce they can barely stand. 
and city streets turn into raging rivers. Typhoon Fei's winds scream inland towards Korea's Pusan Harbor at over 100 miles per hour. The harbor master has no time to evacuate the ships. You are anchor time at South Anchorage, over. 2130 on the second over. During typhoons, uh, visibility drops to zero due to heavy rains. Inside the harbor, huge thrashing waves attack the mainland. The rain prevents ships from leaving the narrow harbor. Ships caught inside are battered by waves and torn apart on the rocks. A small disabled vessel that is being towed to safety breaks loose and is shattered against the breakwater, just as reporter J. Chul Kim arrives on the scene. The waves were about four to five meters high. Most of the ships were evacuated. I was there covering it in the news van. It was horrifying to me watching this boat sink. All seven crew members jumped into the water and the harbor police tried to save them. A brave citizen, in an effort to save lives, jumps into the sea with only a life preserver. I rescued one of the two police officers that were at sea. I helped bring him ashore and went back into the water to get the other one. But when they were pulling us out with the rope, they pulled too fast, and the other guy slipped off and we lost him. Elsewhere, police jerry-rig ropes to rescue survivors. This freighter is barely evacuated just seconds before it flips and sinks. By the time Typhoon Fei is over, 17 people are dead and 25 more are missing. 235 ships are destroyed. A giant freighter, its hull cracked in half, lies at the entrance to the harbor. Even with all this preparation, before a huge disaster of nature, nothing can be done to stop it, for it will come anyway. It is something you cannot control. But it's something you can fight against. No matter what surprises typhoons hold in store, the people of Pusan Harbor will continue to confront them with a will to survive, bred by 2,000 years of facing the evil wind spirit. Up next, Floods of biblical proportions send motorists into a raging river and snowboarders who stray out of bounds and get buried alive. Thundering down from the Laurentian Mountains of Canada's Quebec province are rivers of immense power. Although the water seems calm in the lowlands, the water's potential power remains. Claude Genet lives by the Saguenay River in a converted mill just below the town dam. It's part of the history of our family. It is part of our town. My house is part of the neighborhood. But the neighborhood has forgotten its meteorological history of infrequent deluges so powerful they are called once-in-a-century storms. In July of 1996, three months worth of rain falls in 36 hours. Then an even bigger storm sweeps in. We had two century flood back to back. Geotechnical engineer Jean Vallée watched Quebec's intricate system of dams built to prevent floods fail. It takes about two weeks to empty a reservoir, and the flood was big enough to fill up twice those reservoirs in 48 hours. It cannot absorb the flood. It's just like having no reservoir at all. 
All over the region, evacuations begin. Claude Genet is one of the 12,000 people ordered from their homes. It was around noon or 2 p.m. and there was a notice broadcast telling everyone to evacuate because of potential danger. A few hours later, the worst begins to happen. One reservoir overtops, then another. Water tears through the countryside, creating a flood of biblical proportions. Roads are torn apart and washed away by the violent fury of the river. Flooding continues into the night, but many are unaware of the disaster. Richard Waugh and his four-year-old daughter Vicky don't know they are driving into the flood zone. It was raining an enormous amount. My daughter was sleeping next to me and everything was fine. But Richard can't see that a river has ripped out the highway. His car hurtles into a chasm, tumbling into the raging river below. Water pours through the smashed windshield. There was a lot of water close to my daughter's mouth. Uh, she was having a hard time breathing, and I thought she was beginning to drown. Richard pulls Vicky from the car. They spend the rest of the night clinging to a tree, waiting for help. I thought to myself, how is this going to end? Eh? What's going on? This is like uh, the end of the world. At dawn, rescuers spot a huge gash where a road used to be. Then, they see Richard's car. Vicky is rescued first. Richard is bundled into a sleeping bag to treat his hypothermia. But while the ordeal is ending for Richard and Vicky, it continues for Claude Genet and his neighbors. Steep city streets have become roaring rapids. The torrent is demolishing everything in sight. Somehow, Claude's house remains standing. Built in solid bedrock, it withstands the force of the flood and pounding debris. When the waters recede, Claude's is the only home left habitable in the neighborhood. This neighborhood uh, looks like no one uh, ever lived here. It is now known as the Lucky House. Despite the flooding, Genet plans to stay. There is a risk of living next to a dam, and uh, I think that's uh, a lesson for everyone. Uh, to move away is not even a question for me. Once in a century storms don't happen in precise, predictable intervals. The next great storm could happen in 20 years or 200. When flood survivor Richard Waugh visits the site where he and his daughter nearly drowned, it's with a new understanding that we live by nature's consent. I think that uh, since the accident, uh, every day of my life is like Christmas. It doesn't matter if uh, not, uh, it's not a good day for me. I still have a chance to see my daughter. I have that as a gift. Next, a lost snowboarder faces nature's wrath. Once again, Erie County Sheriff's deputies say they want nobody on the road. Well, I might mention again that the airport is still closed. When a blizzard hits, most people hustle indoors. I'm going to head back in, in, at home right now and relax in the house for a little while, keep warm. But some head for the hills. In parts of the North American Rockies, winter storms can dump enough snow in one season to bury a four-story building. And in this vast white wilderness, people get lost. Yeah, we can move her towards uh, staying on uh, the right side of the peak and coming around the other side would be great. 
ski patrollers erect signs and fences, especially during blizzards, to keep people within ski area borders. The markers are clear and unmistakable, but many ski beyond the safe boundaries. They're powder hounds. They like looking for the fresh powder. Volunteer rescue team leader Tim Jones has a bone to pick with powder hounds who venture out of bounds illegally in Canada's steep and blizzard-prone Pacific Coastal Mountains. They don't know where they're going east, north, south, or west. In this case, a man has blundered onto perilous cliffs and has been trapped overnight. Look at the guy. He's got the yellow pants on. That's the guy right there, for Pete's sake. The first concern is that they could fall. There's waterfalls. They could fall 100 feet to their deaths, and we've had that before. Uh, we have a spinal injury, and we're going very slow and carefully. <laughs> Let him down gently, folks. He's down. Gently. And the next thing is that, that they would either suffer severe frostbite and or hypothermia. And we had a, a chap not long ago lose both his feet in that same area because of it. Both his legs up to his lower calves were rock solid. So when a series of storms off the Pacific dumps two feet of snow on the coastal range, ski patrollers start to close off dangerous areas. But the pristine slopes prove irresistible to 17-year-old Mike Carstairs. He joins a friend at the top of the Cypress Bowl ski area in the early afternoon. So we just kind of slipped underneath the ropes and uh, went to what we thought was towards, towards the snowboard park. Almost immediately, Mike and his friend learned they'd made a serious mistake. We realized that we hadn't seen anybody. We couldn't hear any chairlifts. There's no tracks, and uh, there's nobody around, so we realized that we were lost. The pair grows more worried as the afternoon wears on. Finding themselves trapped in a steep gully, they're forced to follow it downhill. As they cross back and forth through an icy stream, the snowboarders' feet go numb. We didn't actually realize that we were really in trouble until it started getting dark. The snow starts falling fast and thick. Friends at Cypress Bowl alert authorities that the two snowboarders are missing. Nothing moving? No, we'll notify everyone when it's time to move. Everybody that's been issued assignments, come over here. Put it on the radio. Tim Jones mobilizes his rescue team quickly because of the chance the lost teens could wander off a steep cliff. They become dehydrated and exhausted, and then they stop and they start getting cold and their brains don't work. And then the next thing you know, they're making very bad decisions. As more snow falls, searchers worry that the tracks of the two lost snowboarders will be covered up. Even more dangerous, the temperatures start to rise, threatening to turn the falling snow to rain. Wet clothes will increase the risk of hypothermia. Uh, we're following two set of tracks, and one of them is going down the ridge, one of them is going along the ridge. Finally, at 2 a.m., a breakthrough. The searchlights spot the two lost teenagers in a gully. We both heard this whistle, so we started yelling, and uh, we heard them call our names, so we started yelling even more. Mike and his friend Jessica are given hot food, but their ordeal is not over. Now they have over a two-hour trek as the rescue team carefully picks around cliffs and ravines to get them out. At daybreak, they make it back to civilization. North Shore 1, North Shore 4. The, the, the teenagers have learned a lesson about skiing out of bounds. I feel bad for wasting everyone's time. Stay in bounds. <laughs> There's another important reason why ski patrols post boundaries, especially after a blizzard. Harsh winds blow snow into huge overhanging drifts called cornices. They're avalanche time bombs. And what happens is that people go out 
immediately after a storm where there's been huge dumps of snow that have not consolidated and that's when the avalanche hazard is at its, its greatest. In the mountains of North America, people trigger hundreds of avalanches each year, most while venturing out of bounds. Over a hundred people get caught in them. A quarter of them suffocate. This out-of-bounds skier will survive, but more people are killed annually by avalanches than either hurricanes or earthquakes. The ski patrol in Loveland, Colorado, has come up with a system to ensure that reckless young people understand the dangers firsthand. Here's what happens when a snowboarder ventures beyond safe boundaries in front of ski patrollers. Do you have any idea how dangerous a maneuver you just did up there? Sorry. sorry. No, sorry's not quite going to cut it today. The pitch and the aspect of this thing is going to slide any time. You could have been enough to bury us. And then go back. Instead of fining or banning out-of-bounders from the slopes, they teach them a lesson about avalanches and backcountry safety they'll never forget. They bury them alive. What does that feel like laying under all that snow that could just fall on you any time? Well, that's what we want to get across to you, young kids. Once the practice victims are outfitted with radios and homing beacons, they're safely buried. Okay, Adam, talk to me about light. Very, very dark. Ski patrollers practice the probing technique used to find people buried in the snow. Dogs are used because of their acute hearing and sense of smell. The first victim is found within minutes. Breathing all right? Yeah. One proof of the program's effectiveness. Not a single snowboarder who's been through this has been caught out of bounds again. Kind of reflecting like if it would have been real. I mean, that just, that just suck. You'd be under there and just be like in cement. Just because you want to get fresh tracks, it's not even worth it at all. Now that I can see what it's a result of cutting rope, I mean, I never want to do it again. I learned that you don't ski out of bounds. I appreciate it. But rescuers know the lure will continue for other reckless out-of-bounders. The problem with a lot of young people is that they romanticize death maybe and uh, they don't really understand what they're getting themselves into until it's too late. The deadlier the weather conditions, the more seductive the snow. <laughs>